Hey folks, welcome to the latest Remote Learning with Microsoft EDU webinar. I'm Mike Dolphson and I've been hosting these. I work on the Microsoft Education team and we are very excited today because on the agenda after my news and updates, we have Alan November and I'm very excited to have Alan on the show and uh, he is quite the guy I think to give some commentary and thoughts on our current situation with remote learning. And so I am very excited to be talking to Alan. We'll get to that in just a second. But for the news and updates, just our generic quick links that we always show, make sure you know about the EDU remote learning site. This has all of our information on the latest updates around the Microsoft remote learning, free software, tools, tips, and resources. We have the Teams for Education Quick Start Guide that is Microsoft Teams. It is a nice PDF, a teacher can download it and use it really easy for up and running. And it's in a bunch of languages. And then please join our remote learning community. This is over 5,000 educators from all around the country and the world in a big giant Microsoft team, working together, learning from each other. The Microsoft product team is in there. I'm in there. Many of us are helping out these schools and teachers, giving support, answering questions. So please join the community if you haven't already. And then today's updates. So if you've never been to NovemberLearning.com, definitely go there, bookmark it. Lots of great articles, insights, tips, background stuff that all the great work Alan's done for quite a long time now. We also just launched our brand new special education page for all of the resources, accessibility, and other information that's available. And then lastly, our Teams for Education student guide also just came out. And so if you haven't seen this student guide, so all those new students that are just trying out Teams for remote learning, that student guide is super helpful to do that. So those are our updates. Now, Mr. Alan November, who we're gonna be, I'm gonna be handing off to, and we're gonna be doing a little interview. So Alan and I have known each other, gosh, I was thinking Alan, over five years at this point. And we've had a lot of really interesting discussions. He's come out to Microsoft multiple times. He knows the team. He's given us great feedback, given us lots of insights. We quote him often in our hallways. He probably doesn't know that, but we do. Uh, the other thing, Alan and I got to meet at the ISTE conference like six months ago, 10 months ago, back when people could hang out in conferences. Uh, Alan and I uh, hung out. And my other favorite story, Alan, I'm sorry, this might embarrass you, but I'm going to tell this story because it's hilarious to me. Uh, good friend of mine who her name is Becky Keen and Becky and I've known each other. She's pretty unflappable. Becky is a really talented educator and, and a director of PD. About a year and a half or two years ago, we were, I think it was ISTE a couple years ago, we were walking afterwards, Becky and I, and we saw Alan sort of sitting, uh, sitting on a bench. It was after ISTE. He was all alone, probably enjoying the silence and relaxation. <laughs> We walked up and I was like, Alan, uh, hey, how's it going? Meet Becky Keen. And I introduced uh, Becky to Alan and she got so flustered and she could barely talk. And afterwards, she's like, I can't believe you introduced me to Alan November. And so she was quite happy, Alan. That that made her years. So anyways, now with that, we're going to kick over to Alan point. here. I, no more stories. <laughs> no more. It's <laughs> over. Gonna, so uh thanks for coming on the show today alan it's great to have you here uh, so, so i mean let's just get started on some of the th things we'll be talking about today um first off what's been the most surprising thing that you've observed during all this distance learning that's been kicking in in the, in the country and the world for that matter well one of the most surprising things are from parents in my neighborhood. We have a tiny little neighborhood. People walk around on this little tiny path road and uh, people know what I do. So they share stories with me and I ask them, how's it going at home? And what's surprising to me <laughs> is a number of parents in my neighborhood have figured out that two hours a day does it. Their kids do everything they're supposed to do. Uh, and then they have the rest of the day free to think about things. And, and I also have a client uh, 
in South America, who is the executive director of a network of 65 schools that happen to uh, speak English. And they discovered that there were any number of students for a variety of reasons who are doing better online than they did face to face. And they're going to launch a virtual academy across all their schools next year. Wow. So what's interesting to me is that uh, the crisis has revealed some, some structural uh, elements, made people more aware and have catapulted some decision making uh, in a completely different direction than I think we, we, we were going to go without the crisis. That's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I've heard a lot where people say, you know, when all this ends, it's not like everything is going to revert exactly how it used to be. There's going to be a lot of changes that come of this that sort of just that's going to be the new way to operate. So that I think that's a, a fascinating topic to, to follow. Oh, I hope so, yeah. If you know that quote about don't waste a crisis, if if we yeah. do not deal with some serious structural flaws we've had for a long time, we will have wasted this crisis. Yeah, I agree. Um, so here's another one. You've you've talked about this for <laughs> probably decades. And in terms of you talk a lot about one of the toughest things in education is uh, giving up control. Yeah. And wow, if there isn't a time when people are having to give up control, wow. it will be now. And so what, there you if, go. what are your thoughts? <laughs> if, if, you know, somebody said to me the other day, if you can't control 25 kids on Zoom and maybe it was never a good idea to control 25 kids at once. And that, that, so that'd be an example. Do we go back and give lectures and does the teacher transfer knowledge? Or do we give kids problems to solve without giving them all the information they need and make them learn how to learn? So I think in the balance, Mike, one of my concerns has been, a friend of mine in Australia describes it as spoon feeding that the spoon feeding has to stop. Giving kids well-organized uh, presentations with all the right answers in the right places to take the next test. Maybe we shouldn't do that when we go back. Maybe, uh, maybe we should make kids hunt for answers. The web's filled with tools. And uh, that every kid's on the same page on the same day, taking the same test on the same day, clearly, that did not come out of cognitive science. Uh, so I'm hoping that we're going to recognize that we've under we've underestimated a lot of kids, uh, probably overestimated some kids, and that we have to figure out the new balance. Well, on the topic of control, have you talked to any, you probably are talking to some school leaders and you don't have to name any names, but people you've yeah. talked to online about this topic, like have you, has it come up? Yeah, it, it, it's it's one of when I do a webinar and show tools and examples of teachers work. Uh, all of it is asynchronous. None of it is the, you know, the Zoom lecture. Uh, and I do think we've underestimated kids willingness. For example, um, there's a lot of work at Harvard on first time learners teaching first time learners. And the, the danger is it only goes at Harvard, but I think lots of kids across the country, the world, will ask a friend for help without even touching a teacher for help. And that's because they think their friend understands them and their friend can explain it the way another kid understands it. And, and uh, so the opportunity, let's just take that opportunity that all along, Many kids who needed it the most never asked their teachers for help all year. And if you accept that, and then you look at the online learning, you realize that, you know, there are tools we have where kids can help each other, one to one, two to one, four to four. Uh, you record those sessions where kids are helping each other. And the teacher listens to that. The teacher listens to how kids help each other. And the learning that a teacher could do 
by listening to a series of these recordings, which are easy to make online, right? I think, I, ha I know, I have met teachers who've taught online who say they learn more by listening in than they ever would have heard in their controlled classroom. Yeah, so I don't want to get to personalized right. instruction. I think we all, you know, personalized instruction for a lot of people is the holy grail. How do I design for the unique learner that everyone is, the resources this kid need compared to that kid? And it's just too much work. Or ordinarily, that would that would kill a teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, so we haven't done it, really. But now that we're in this crisis, I am convinced that over time, the value of a teacher, the subject knowledge is going to go down. That's available on the web. The diagnostic knowledge of teachers learning how their students learn, I think we're going to value that more moving forward. That would be a seismic shift if we do. Yeah, that's a that's why I love talking to you, Alan. Get these awesome insights, a lot of really interesting thoughts that I hadn't thought before, so that's a great one. That's a very interesting insight to, to think about. Uh, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, well, I think the teacher is the head learner. I think teachers should be learning all the time. A lot of teachers will agree to this. this is not my idea. You know, it's but but there's so much structure that holds teachers back, like high stakes testing. It's gone now. Have a blast. Have fun. <laughs> Don't worry about it. The bell's not going to ring. You don't have to give a test on Friday. This is the time to experiment. Yeah, that's great advice. Very good advice. Um, so you talked to a lot of school leaders, obviously, and, and you, I know you spent a lot of time. You've talked to them all over the world. And so right now, if you were to be talking with school leaders, what's your advice? What's Alan November's advice for school leadership during distance learning? Like, what are the top things? any school leader should be thinking about? Well, it's the, the, at the very top is another cultural shift. We're not just talking about schools designed to help kids learn. Now we're talking about the whole family. So building capacity for the family, you know, the, I, I think it's going to be a really important um, opportunity for schools to deepen the success of kids. If we can help parents read more to their young children, if we can have grandparents record their Skype calls about their history, if we can help parents understand how to allow kids to self-correct, you know, allow them to struggle, the struggle is important. If we can build capacity in just to learn about what's under the kitchen sink in terms of science, uh, it's the family. So that, that's a big one. How do you reorganize your 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 focus to involve engage the whole family? Another one is what we've just and I got to add in when you say family because I know I, I focus a lot on this and families where the parents don't speak the native language and how do you engage them with the right yes. with technology yes. to communicate? But just throw that in. Yeah, and unfortunately, <laughs> I, I just recorded a podcast. A friend of mine, superintendent outside Detroit, his, his number one thing is delivering food. Those kids don't have breakfast or lunch. Uh, so, but he's out there doing that. So when we go back, it's not just the online, it's physical. But I'd like to tell a story about uh, parents who don't speak English. Years ago, gosh, it must be 20 years ago in Akron, Ohio, I was uh, part of a process, early one-to-one uh, -one initiative. And this school required that every parent come in to sign off for the computer. And the way they did it is they organized a, uh, a, a dinner, a potluck dinner. So there was food mm -hmm. and there was kids singing. They, they really did it well. They, they, they did it well. And the community showed up. It was amazing. People who had never set foot in that school showed up that night. And I sat with a bunch of moms and I'm just going to tell you, there were no dads where I was sitting. Uh, many of them did not speak English, but I was able to have a conversation with one. And, and I said, why have you never come before? 
because that's what she let me know. I've never been to school before. And I, and I said, what, what was it? And she said, I was uh, school traumatized when I was a kid. I'm never coming. This is different. This is they're honoring me. They're they're letting me come and bring food. They're they're giving me a role with my child. That's why I'm here, because they're giving me a role. They're not just talking at me. And I think we need to do more of that metaphorically. We need to engage those parents and honor them where they are. Yeah. Anyway, the family letting go of control. You've mentioned. I think leaders are going to when the, when teachers come back or before they come back, uh, let them know they have freedom to experiment. They will not be punished. They will make mistakes. They will have some failures. But this is the time that we should be looking at some structural issues, like how we organize time and space. Uh, like, you know, bells ringing, things like that. Uh, relationships would be a third. How do we organize our relationships? And and I, you know, mentioned earlier, kids helping kids, kids designing tutorials. You and I have talked about this. Mm -hmm. While kids are home right now, elementary kids, middle school kids, they should be challenged to get Minecraft and design tutorial worlds in Minecraft so that kids can make a contribution. I'm, I'm real big on making a contribution all the way across. Yeah. Uh, so those would be my top ideas. We organize for the family. We give teachers freedom to experiment and we tap kids for their uh, natural design to contribute to the whole learning process of the community. Love That's it. Top three. I love that. You like okay, not... top three? Yeah. What's that? You like those? Do you? I, I do. Like no, I, I do. I like him a lot. I really like the family aspect because I think that's, I mean, we just had the family, um, we had a family webinar episode on Thursday and uh, one of the gentlemen was saying like, look, and he was a parent, he's like, look, at this point, like I never planned to be a teacher, but I essentially am a lot of cases at home right now. I'm having to just adapt and help and do things that I did not plan on. Yeah. Uh, right. And so back, growth mindset, giving up control, all the above. So it's a huge topic that I think a lot of people can relate to right now. Yeah, we should not lose that energy when we go back. We should be making yeah. plans now to engage the family continuously. Agree. Um, so another one you've been talking about a long time, and we, we throw this, you know, Michelle Freed, uh, the general manager of our group, throws this quote around a lot which is the $1,000 pencil, the Allen of Ember $1,000 pencil, meaning computers that are used just like a pencil is, they just cost $1,000. Yeah. So now that we're all doing this distance learning thing, uh, what are your thoughts on the $1,000 pencil or whatever it might cost and just doing things the same or doing things different? Right. Well, my sense is that if we give old work, you know, assignments that were designed before the power of the web with new tools, even in a crisis, we're gonna get the same results we always got. That, that the real challenge in front of us to break through this thousand dollar pencil metaphor, I think is to redesign the work that we give kids. So for example, I, but I was just on Bing. I don't know if I could show this or not, but uh, you can share your screen, go for it. Share my screen. Yeah, okay. you're right. Uh, this, I'm doing this, so you'll have to tell me if I zoom in and out of here. Uh, let's see. I don't see the desk. I'm gonna, this will be my uh, here we go. Can you see this, Mike? I can. All right, so I did a little search. I used two uh, operators, site and file type built into Bing. So oh, right now I see your PowerPoint. I don't see the, the Bing. Oh, thing. you don't. Oh, OK, I see this and you don't. Hmm. All right, then. And if you exit the PowerPoint there, you'll probably uh, hit e escape and you'll probably your I'm guessing your browser pops up if you leave PowerPoint mode. Yeah, I don't know. Um, or the equivalent of escape on the Apple, which I don't know what that is. <laughs> End uh, presentation. I'll hit, I'll hit escape. That didn't do anything. Um, let me go. 
And and you know what? I've uh, now I've also lost the tab where we're talking to each other. Um, so how do I move it around? I don't know. We've kicked it back to you now. Um, so Kick it's, it's focused it's on you now. Of, yeah. So it's all Alan now. It's all Alan all the time. All right. Well, what I did, here's what I, I just did a search. Uh, site colon ac.uk, that give me all British universities. File type colon PPT, that gives me only PowerPoints at British universities. Then I found Romeo and Juliet. So I got these PowerPoints from British universities on Romeo and Juliet. Mm -hmm. Then I can get PowerPoints on Romeo and Juliet from Australia and Ireland, from all over the world. I can get content and I can get it with different cultural perspective. So the difference between one teacher giving a PowerPoint on Romeo and Juliet and having all 25 kids pay attention at once, right? Mm -hmm. Taking notes, thousand dollar pencil. Compare that to kids are at home and you can ask them to collect PowerPoints from around the world and remix them purposely using the content to design a new PowerPoint on a, a theme that shows the difference in cultural interpretation of an aspect of Romeo and Juliet. To me, the, the PowerPoints from around the world being remixed with a written defense of why students pick those slides is a much more powerful learning experience than kids taking notes from one teacher's PowerPoint without the global cultural perspective. There's an example mm -hmm. it's a great of the one. change in the design of the work. So the content is the same, Romeo and Juliet, because we're always going to do Shakespeare. I got that forever. Mm -hmm. I got I got it. But we don't, but what we could do is really tap the power of the web to make it much more fascinating than it currently is. That that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, no, it'll be it'll be interesting to see the different types of. I mean, I th it's funny. One of the things you probably are familiar with Flipgrid, but what I think I love about Flipgrid yeah. that I've seen is that it's a very simple tool. There's no like you've got to do it this way. It's just a response. But the educators come up, they redesign lessons to completely incorporate Flipgrid and video and creativity, and that's I feel like the explosion that you see of really cool things happening with educators and students in Flipgrid is that it it is not prescriptive and it's simple. And so then the creativity comes out and a lot of educators redesign their lesson plans to be very different with that Flipgrid technology. Well, I'm on a Flipgrid teacher website right now. Happens to be uh, Stacy Roshan is an AP Calculus teacher. Mm -hmm. Stacy's amazingly creative. Yeah. And she introduced me to the power of Flipgrid years ago. And Stacy was forced to teach an online AP Calculus course on her campus because of scheduling conflicts years ago. And, and to her surprise, the kids online did better on the AP exam than the face-to-face -face kids, right? Mm -hmm. And that was a shock. And then I asked her, you know, I said, what's going on? What, what, how did that happen? <laughs> and she said, the kids in face to face, they wait, me, they wait for me to start class. The kids who are in my online AP class, I go in there and they're already talking to each other. They're helping each other. They're not waiting for me to start class. Time is much more efficient uh, in the online class because of I don't have the control that kids physically see me having in a classroom. Mm -hmm. So there's an example of giving up control and getting better results on a standard test. Yeah, that's a good one. Stacy's amazing. Yeah, she's Stacey's uh, amazing. And Stacy also taught me this concept that if teachers really want to learn about their kids, that one of the most powerful experiences is to have them work together, help each other. You can use Flipgrid and they record the session and the teacher gets to watch it later. And the other thing Stacy does, I think, is that some of the, the most powerful sessions of you know a kid having an aha moment, a breakthrough, 
because a friend could explain it. I'm pretty sure she keeps those and is building a library of these incredible conversations in AP Calculus. And those will be available potentially in the future for future kids to be able to also listen in on how do kids ask questions to one another and help each other. Yeah, that's a, that's a very cool technique or, or, or tool to try. Uh, I would encourage people. Yeah, that's a yeah, no, I'm sure there are a lot of lesson redesigns. I'm hoping not all, but there's got to be some out there where they're, they're trying some radically different things to just. The uh, the times call for lots of new ideas and trying new things, and I'm sure people are going to discover some pretty crazy ones that work. Um, yeah, I want to hear okay. about it. Have yeah. have in touch. <laughs> so this is one that you and I have talked about this next topic. I care a lot about it. Uh, how do you think about equity when we're thinking about distance learning? Well, I, I, as you alluded to earlier, I, I've seen, unfortunately, I've seen graphs of what happens to kids over the summer across socioeconomic lines. And as you can imagine, uh, some kids grow over the summer and some kids fall behind. So year after year, kids fall behind. That's summertime. Um, I think some kids are falling behind. I don't, I don't think we have to look hard to find that. So I think when we get back, the gaps are going to be wider. The, the digital divide is real. And uh, we're going to have to work overtime. That's why the whole family, I think, is important uh, in, in how we think about helping kids, uh, especially young children having parents read to their kids or grandparents or recordings of grandparents reading, um, honoring those parents. I'll tell you, I have a friend who uh, taught me a lot about family. Her name is Gail Moore. She's from Lizard Lick. North Carolina. <laughs> I'm not making that up, Mike. And uh, Gail would call every family, every mom. This is a very poor community. In the first week of school, you know, she made a couple calls a night, so she got through it. And uh, she would say, "I'm your your kid's teacher. This is my responsibility." She'd list her responsibilities. This is your child's responsibility. And I would love for you to come into class at least once this year and tell a story. Anything you want. It can be any story you want. It can be about cooking. It can be about fishing. It can be about tra anything you want. <laughs> but I've learned that parents have great stories. I'll even help you organize your story if you want to, but I need you to come to class. So what she did is she basically convinced every single parent once a year to come to class and tell a story. And it didn't have to be to the whole class. She might have a couple parents telling stories at once in different groups of kids. But Gail was convinced that by honoring the knowledge and the stories and the wisdom of her parents, they worked extra hard when she called and needed their help because she honored their knowledge and wisdom. Little things like that I think are really important, especially with underserved communities who often feel, as I said earlier, that they're traumatized by the whole parenting experience since they were a kid. What? How about special education? That's another one that I think a lot about special education, uh, accessibility, and, and how that plays in equity, right? Again, back to the parents and family, maybe there was extra help at school, and now there's none, and yeah. maybe there's digital versus not. Have you seen, heard, talked to people who are thinking through that situation? Well, I, I do have a friend named Madeline Puglesi who specializes in that. We, we haven't talked recently, so you, you caught me this time. Um, I, I don't have a general approach, special ed, other than it's the same opportunity that we're going to help the whole family understand 
you know, building a safe home for learning for that particular child. Uh, and then there's some things I don't think we can make up. Um, I, I wish I had more for you, Mike. I can, I can tell you, you know, again, things like Minecraft, you know, for kids who are dyslexic, um, you now have a visual world you can build, tell your stories instead of writing. Um, mathematics for kids who are struggling, you know, one of my favorite tools is Wolfram Alpha that shows you every single step. And you can change an aspect of an equation, like take out the exponent and see what happens to the graph. And so I think we have these interactive tools and these creative tools that more and more special ed kids should have access to. But that's just not my area of expertise, Mike. Sorry. Oh, that's cool. I was just curious. Um, so we'll wrap up last question here. I mean, you, you touched on it maybe from the school leadership standpoint. I'm curious, uh, and you gave some great, great advice. If you were talking to teachers right now out there, what are three, the three most practical tips? Not necessarily the long-term tips, but like what are the Alan November, like three practical tips, even for the next couple of months that people could take away? Yeah, one is small group work. Get kids to talk. They're going to talk to each other anyway. So <laughs> uh, take advantage of that need for kids to be online with their friends and create, create teamwork. Kids helping kids. Uh, if you're lucky, the kids will know how to hit a record button and they can send those files to their teacher so the teacher can learn how those kids helped each other. Uh, a second is ask kids to do your research to find the best, say, YouTube videos on a tutorial of something in the curriculum so that you can see what kids are valuing. You know, very often, Mike, I'll go to a school and I'll ask kids in a, in a meeting, how many of you have found a YouTube video that helps you? Just about every kid raises their hand. And then I'll say, how many of you have shared that with your teacher? And no kids raise their hand. They're <laughs> afraid to tell their teacher they found it because they think the teacher will be insulting that the kid went somewhere else. This crisis is perfect. Get kids <laughs> to do your research for you. <laughs> have them give you the best tutorials in every subject um, and then they'll do it they'll absolutely do it uh, let's see number three in enjoy you know talk to each other uh, now is the time of building relationships across the faculty even though we're not next to each other you know sharing stories uh, a high school teacher calling a kindergarten teacher you know what are you doing um, so the opportunity to bring the faculty together in conversations one-to-one -one who might never have spoken to each other before, I think is a golden opportunity, Mike. Those are great. That Those are great. I like the things that teachers can do now or in the next week or two um, just to make sure they're taking advantage, quote, of the crisis and things to, to really act on. So, well, with you know, that, Alan, what's that? Oh, fourth thing. If you're if you're open to it, I'd ask parents, what have you done? What have you found? What what's what's happening in your house that is really working? Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, I you know <laughs> I wrestle with this myself. I have an eleven year old daughter and she's doing distance learning and it's not a cakewalk every day, right? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> um, so that's a good one. Well, Alan, hey, thank you so much for joining us today this has been great and it's really good to see you again even though it's not in person you know see your face uh we've texted a little and talked on phone but it's it's nice to see the actual uh face to face and i'm really glad you're able to share your uh wisdom and knowledge with all these other folks out there and this will be posting on youtube so everyone can watch it uh, time immemorial and uh so anyways Thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate well, it. Mike, you, you're doing you're doing fun work, Mike. For people who don't know you, you're, you're an amazing global thinker. Uh, it's wonderful. Yeah, put that back. Whatever you just did was helpful. The witch. Yeah, there you go. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks, Alan. All good. Take care, Mike. Be good. Be well.
<laughs> Be well, everybody. Do. And just to wrap up the last couple of recaps for the updates, we have Alan's November Learning website. Check out his blog, his website, his resources. He has a podcast he just started up too. We have the Special Education and Accessibility Resources, brand new site on the educator community. One of my personal favorites, this site is really deep, really broad, super helpful. And then lastly, the Teams for Education Student Guide. Get this to your students, help them get up and running on Teams really easily and really quickly. And that just came out last week. And then when, if you want to get today's webinar notes, the PowerPoint will be posting tomorrow. The recording will be posting on our YouTube playlist right here. That's coming out probably tomorrow morning. We'll get that posted up. And then and if you have any support issues or tickets, anything you need help with, please go to this link right here. We have people who are focused just on helping educators and schools for support. So file a support ticket. And then coming up, we've got Microsoft Stream for video and remote learning on Thursday. Uh, another, and it's been so popular, Microsoft Teams meetings. We have Gordon Chang back on Friday to talk about IT admin policies, settings, and deployments if you're using Microsoft Teams for meetings and class meetings. And then Monday, May 4th, two other gentlemen I'm a huge fan of, Dr. Anthony Niebold and Dr. Darren Clay from formerly Fulton County Schools. Uh, Darren is now at the Georgia Department of Education. Uh, Anthony still in the Georgia uh, Fulton County. They'll be coming on the show to talk about school leadership and distance learning on the May 4th. Hey, that's uh, May the 4th be with you. Maybe they'll wear a Star Wars t-shirt. We'll see. And the whole schedule is below. If you want to check out what's coming soon, go to our remote learning schedule. And other than that, thank you very much to Maryline, who's our producer behind the scenes, and also Cheryl, who's been helping out as well. And we will see you soon.